this is Erica with Launching Legacies. Welcome to our daily devotional. We are doing um, a continu we're continuing our series on cleaning the contaminated soil of our lives. So, yesterday we talked about the potato test, um, and we talked about um, identifying that the gnats were more pervasive than just you know a simple once in a while nuisance that they actually had contaminated the soil. Yesterday, we used the potato test to verify that the soil was indeed contaminated, found that, yep, um, the the larvae or that the gnats had laid was actually eating up the potatoes that were placed on the soil. And so the potato test told us that the soil wasn't well. And remember that we looked at a passage. Give me a second. Cue everything up. Um, we looked at a passage from Ephesians 4 verse 31 and we looked at the things that we need to get rid of and we use that as our potato test. And so today we're going to look at Ephesians. We're in the next chapter of Ephesians and in Ephesians 5, we're going to talk about the next step. Before I start the scripture though, let me tell you what the next step was. What did I do next? Okay, so after I find these potatoes are indeed um, being munched on in little tiny ways, then I said, okay, well, we there's nothing we can do for this soil, right? Because if the soil wasn't indeed contaminated, there wasn't larvae, and if these potatoes weren't really being eaten, then we had a surface level issue. We just had the gnats that were coming because of the moisture, but the gnats had been there long enough to actually lay lay their larvae so that means now the soil has hatchlings in it all these different things so we don't want to have the uh the contamination from the gnats in the soil so then what we do next is clearly we have to remove the soil okay and removing the soil is kind of a big deal because this plant is not small i'm going to show it to you at the end of the week but the plant is not very small so when the soil um, needed to be removed, it was a big undertaking. And luckily, I had um, my niece here with me. And so I was able to elicit her help. She's a young little girl. So she helped me to um, to get the plant that now had rooted itself in the soil. See, because that's the dilemma. Soil is contaminated, but plants love soil because their roots go down deep in the richness of it and start to take the nutrients and all the good stuff and the water that you put in there out of the soil and they love they love the soil so you can imagine this root system was really intertangled and intermingled in the soil and it was not easy to break up the soil without damaging the plant roots in order to rescue the plant but we did it we we worked through it I had a, a few mishaps but it was fun it was fun doing uh working with the plant with my niece nonetheless we pulled it up and um, and of course, you can't leave the contaminated soil on the plant at all. So the plant has to be washed. Okay. So we used um, a bit, a little bit of plant soap, but more so just water, um, and cleaned all of the soil off the root system. Now roots are very delicate, right? They're very fragile, small little veins, like the veins in our in our body. And they, um, so they're very, very delicate. And so when you're washing with water, you have to be very delicate, very patient. I was teaching my niece to make sure you don't, you're not gonna just wipe down really harshly because you'll break off all of the root system. So you wanna be very delicate in rinsing and washing this root system of the contamination. And in, in this parallel, we're gonna look at how the, Bible talks about washing or purifying ourselves from contamination in the in the world. Like, how does God do that? Well, you'll learn that if, if you um, start to study the word that that he does it often through, well, three main things that he uses. And there, there may be more, but these are the three main things that occur over time as a themes in the Bible for purification. One is through the blood of Christ, right? Not just the blood of Christ, right? And then the... Um, I was going to say not human blood, like this, this is not advocated for, but the blood of Christ, who is God and man, right? And so the blood of Christ is one way that things are clear, are purified. The second, um, through fire and the third through water. Okay. And if we talk about Old Testament sacrifice, then it would have been the blood of animals, but they weren't, it wasn't clean. It wasn't cleaning. It was atoning. So, um, we have to be mindful of these three ways. And today we're going to talk about what, what I use to clean the contamination off of the soil of the plant is the washing with the water. Okay. And instead of water though, um, the analogy is used for water. Actually, God says that we are washed with the word. Okay. With his 
word. So let's look at Ephesians 5. We're going to look at verse um, 25 and 26. And I want you to pay attention to context because many people think, okay, well, this is only about wives and husbands, but no, it's not. Um, it's actually a parallel to Christ in the church. And that's the, that parallel portion is what we're actually going to highlight this. We're not going to talk about marriage at this point. Okay. And so it says in verse 25 though, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Okay. That's good. So he's given a context and now he's going to talk about how Christ loved the church. This is what Christ did for the church and his love for the church he gave up his life for her okay the church being her okay to make her or the church holy and clean by washing by excuse me clean washed by the cleansing of god's word okay and so let's talk about what that means, okay? Because when in in the context of marriage, which is different, we were not going to really touch it. What they re what he really wants though is for the husband to exemplify Christ-like behavior and mannerism toward the wife. Okay, got that. Now, what is Christ-like behavior and mannerism? Because that becomes something interesting and it doesn't just exist within the context of marriage. Marriage is just a parallel. So what is Christ doing for the church, which is all of the people who are believers, right? What is he doing for the body, collective church body, uh, that makes her clean, makes the church, which is using a feminine, feminine pronoun, which is making the church clean. The church is being clean by the washing of God's word. Okay. So God's word is making us clean making the church clean. And now what does that mean? Okay. Well, it means that God's word, okay, has a power to de destroy de debris, doubt, sin, okay, death, contamination. And so what happens is the fulfillment of God's word is pure. It is true, is right, is just. It detoxifies. It helps us to be well and it removes from us that which has contaminated us, which in this analogy is sin. And so the washing of God's word is the truth of his word purifying us from the distractions, the brokenness, the sin of the world, the contamination of the world that we spoke about in Ephesians 4.31, right? Get rid of the anger and the wrath and the bitterness and all of these things. And so we're going to get rid of those things by using the washing, uh, by being washed in the word. And Jesus washes us in the word by fulfilling the word that God has said. In other words, by doing what God said, proving the truth of what God has already said, what happened is the washing of the word. Okay. And so it's like doing exactly what God said he would do, setting as a standard of purity, of trustworthiness, of making well. So let's, let's use, uh, some chemical substances, for example. Let's kind of move away from water and let's look at, um, let's look at alcohol. So sometimes we need to use rubbing alcohol to clean a wound. Now, what would happen if what was labeled as alcohol was really just water? And we needed the alcohol to actually clean the wound. Well, the answer is the wound wouldn't be clean, right? Because the al alcohol is far more astringent than, than water is. And so the, the alcohol has substances in it, particles in it that help to clean thoroughly, more thoroughly than water does. And so what is happening here is God's word is potent because it is what it says that it is. And he has done what he says he will do. And so his his word is strong enough to really clean us and make us well. So what happens if our soil is contaminated, right? What happens if we do the potato test from Ephesians 4 and we look at all the different things and other things in our life that are not well? How do we then apply the word to make us well? Well, my simple, I mean, a little bit more maybe than many, application of the word is to really find myself in the word and wrestle with the places that are difficult for me. So for one, bitterness. It says, don't let bitterness grow up, but be grow up in you because it will defile many. So it's talking about not being bitter with other people, but showing grace in this passage in, in Ephesians, actually. Um, 
I'm sorry, Hebrews, Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Okay. And so in Hebrews 12, he's talking about, don't let bitterness grow up. It'll defile many people. Right. But, but show grace. Remember not to move away from the grace of God. That's what the passage in, in Hebrews 12 is discussing. Okay. So that means to me, if I'm having a hard time and I want to be bitter towards somebody, I want to have an issue with someone, then I need to wrestle with it. I need to wait until it's full, I'm fully washed with that word, right? That the truth of the word stands bigger than the contamination in my mind or my heart or whatever place in me wants to be bitter. So I have to go back and engage and dialogue back and forth and have this conversation with the word, the truth of the word until it cleanses me and makes me well. If it's saying that my bitterness will defile many, and I know I'm not trying to defile many, then I, but I'm still bitter. Then I've got a problem that I need to work out within the context. I need to figure out why, why am I bitter? Why is it so hard for me to let go of whatever it is I'm holding on to? And there's a process uh, and a washing process that comes with the word. Now, is it brainwashing? No, but it's clarifying the places where we are stuck. And the person who is arrogant says that they're not stuck, right? The person who is humble says, I know that I shouldn't be bitter. I know I shouldn't be angry. I know I shouldn't be resentful, right? The things that are being washed are things that actually need to be removed. I know I don't need to be this way. And so when I'm this way, I need you to help me, God. And so I go through the process of wrestling with the things that I know shouldn't be there. These contaminants in the soil that I've now identified through this potato test shouldn't be here. And I've got to find a way in the wrestling to clarify where this really came from and allow the word to tell me it's okay to get rid of it. It's okay to get rid of this. You don't need to you don't need to be angry. You don't need to be bitter bitter. You don't need to be frustrated. You don't need to to have this problem here. You need to be able to get rid of these things that you're holding on to. It's a lot of work cleaning soil. And it was a lot of work working with that plant. I'm just letting you know, it's a big plant. So it wasn't like a little tiny, you know, thing. But when we look at the plant at the end of the week, we'll be able to see how well it's doing and the state of the soil at this current time. And you'll be able to appreciate the fact that we won't see any gnats, but the tree will be reestablished strong and growing healthy. Until tomorrow, please be blessed. We're praying for you. We hope that you're praying for us and we will continue this devotional series tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye.